morning, everyone. Welcome at day four. I hope you're not tired yet, because we have a lot of interesting sessions coming up later today and tomorrow. But in this first uh, one and a half hour, I want to give you a quick heads up on uh, security technology that has been introduced recently in the web. So you might have heard already some of the techniques in previous sessions, like the session of Jim, the session of Philip. What the goal of my session today is, is actually to get you a little bit more acquainted with those new technologies. And I hope by the end of the session, I get you convinced to actually deploy some of those technologies in your web applications in the near future. So about myself, I'm Levin Desmet. I'm a research manager on software security here at the local university. I'm actively engaged in uh, OWASP. So as you saw on Tuesday already on the, the Belgium chapter meeting, I'm one of the board members. And also I'm actually one of the co-organizers of the European conference in May uh, in Europe of OWASP. I'm also doing the program for SecUpDev. Um, our research group itself is about 75 researchers working on secure software, distributed software. And we actually have a dedicated team on web application security. And you saw already some people working that team in uh, previous sessions, like Philip, like Frank. I will talk quick heads up on some of the technologies today. If you want to have a little bit more detail on some of these technologies to see a little bit more on the rated work, we've also written up wide some know-how on web security, especially the client side, in a book already mentioned before. And if you're lucky in the raffle, you can actually win this book as well. We're actually trying to focus the most important client-side security topics. What are the best practices? Uh, what, are the, uh, what is the state of the art in research and standardization? Actually, how do you deploy those technologies in practice? And actually, you can see it as a, a good entry level for researchers, but also for practitioners. But enough uh, promotion. Let's really focus on the recent web technologies. So if we're talking about web security technologies, uh, many of you already will be referred to the OWASP top 10, will refer to the SUNS top 25. Actually, what I want to do in this talk today is actually skip all those. So I think they are very important to know how to code your application right. And I think this is step number one. I think Jim already did a good job in previous sessions to explain you how you could actually improve in coding your application. What I want to do today is actually say how in a complementary way you could actually build an additional layer of defense on top of your application by configuring certain things on the server side that have an impact on the client side security. So what do I mean with that? So normally we have a web application between the browser and the web server. Within the topics I want to discuss today is actually the way you can specify a certain security policy on the server side, but push that security policy to the client and the client is enforcing that security policy. And I think this paradigm of actually server-driven client-side security enforcement is really the new hype in web security. So we see more and more is happening on the client side. We know quite well how to secure the server side, but now we want actually to make sure that the server owner, the application owner, gets back in control of how the client side enforcement is actually enforcing security. So what I will do today in my talk is I will very briefly, only one slide, give you a quick heads up on the security model. For people that already went to the session of Philip yesterday, this is just a quick recap, what's the basic security model. And then I will actually focus on three categories, uh, browser server communication, script injection, and framing, and see for those three topics what are recent technologies being added on the server side and in your browser that you can actually deploy to actually configure security policies. And if time permits, I would also like to give you a quick example of how you can combine different technologies together to build a security architecture for your web application. Good. But as promised, a quick overview. So you already heard it in many talks, the same origin policy is really the driving factor of the security policy on the web. So it actually means um, that you are trying to isolate different applications from each other so that you can't read data from other applications running in the same browser environment. What does it mean for your application? Actually, if you're including scripts, it means that even if you are loading third-party scripts into your browser environment, they're still running in the same security context of the rest of your page. It actually means that they're embedded in your application as if they were actually written by the application developer themselves. So there's no security boundary between third-party JavaScript and the application embedding that JavaScript. Uh, in contrast, if you're using iframes, and you're using different origins, you actually have two different security contexts, and you really have a different boundary between the security context and the same origin policy kicks in. This means that content running 
in the iframe of your third party will not be able to access data running in the outer uh, frame. And this is a very hard isolation factor that you can use in your application. And as already mentioned by Philip yesterday, typically you want to have something in between. You want to be able to interact in a controlled way with your third party, but your, control, uh, your third party needs to be isolated from most of the things in your application. And we will see some techniques today how you can achieve that. But also, if you didn't see the presentation of Philip yesterday, this is something worth to actually rewind and look into the video uh, after SecUp Dev. So, this was a very, very quick intro. This is the only basic information you need to follow the rest of the uh, presentation. So this is quite nice, right? <laughs> so, what I want to do is actually start with secure browser server communication. And this is a topic already mentioned a few times. Also, it is ha has been hyped in the last two years quite a lot in media. We're having problems in actually securing the communication between the browser and the server. So what I will explain in this session is actually I will focus on session hijacking and SSL stripping, and we will see a set of countermeasures that you can apply to actually provide a better communications channel between the client and the server. But I first will focus on session hijacking. And this is an attack already mentioned during one of the talks of Jim, where you actually say, well, we're browsing with a cookie from your browser to the server, and the cookie gets sent over and over with every request to that particular website. What if an attacker can actually read out, for instance, that session identifier over the network? Well, he can actually copy that session identifier in his own browser and actually replaying your session to the server, actually being able to impersonate you to that web application. What other techniques to actually uh, protect against that? Well, the first thing is make sure that your attacker can't read the data on the network. Using SSL, not so uh, spectacular. And with that, we actually make sure that the eavesdropper will not be able to access over the network our cookie. But then the question is, is the problem cured? Well, yes and no. And let me explain. So the first thing is, yes, TLS already provides you better protection against eavesdroppers to actually steal, for instance, data such as a session identifier or to modify the web pages and the scripts running on the client side. But we see if you're looking to the uh, adop adoption rate of TLS, that's quite low. So those figures are from Qualys in 2010. But if you look to recent figures, it increased a little bit, but still the adoption rate of TLS is way too low to actually being protecting a lot of websites. So we see here that only less than a fraction, less than 1% of the active domains were using TLS. For the most popular websites, this was a little bit higher, around one fourth, uh, one, one, fourth, one third of the websites are actually using TLS. But even if you're using TLS, there are still some problems remaining. And this is what the rest of this topic will be about. Well, what if we have actually mixed use of HTTP and HTTPS? What if they are actually including HTTP resources in your web application? And what happens with the whole bootstrapping part? What can you do with SSL stripping attacks? So the first one, and this is all, probably something you all know already, so I will quickly recap. If you're using HTTPS, you have to make sure that you're only using HTTPS for your cookies. So if you're using cookies both on HTTP and HTTPS and you don't protect your cookies, they actually will be able to send out over HTTP. What can you do with that? Uh, you can easily add a secure flag to your cookies, and this means the browser will set that cookie only to be sent over HTTPS. And I really want to encourage you, if you're using TLS, make sure that you're using this flag, because saying, well, I only deploy them over HTTPS is not sufficient. Imagine that you have a website that is actually running all the important pages over HTTPS. The only thing an attacker needs to do is to make sure that one of the requests triggered from your browser is HTTP to leak out your cooking information. So you don't even have to uh, have HTTP requests on your website. If the attacker is able to run any HTTP embedded image or whatever on an older website, you already will be able to strip out your cookie on the network. So you really have to protect it in the browser. And this is a very simple policy saying to the browser, make sure that cookie is only sent over HTTPS. Quick recap, we should only have session identifiers using, uh, we should for all session identifiers in our session, having the secret flag set and only use those session identifiers over HTTPS. Of course, I will see a lot of technologies in this presentation. What I think is important to actually have a, a kind of feeling, what is the adoption rate of certain technology? Just to give an image, what is actually the best practices being applied right now? What domains are using this technology? What is the adoption rate? 
So to do that, we actually did an experiment at the university where we visited the top 2,500 websites visited from Belgium. So if you're going to Alexa, we can actually ask which are the most popular web pages visited from Belgium. And from those most popular websites, the 2,500, we were actually measuring how much of the technology I present today they were actually adopting in their web applications. And as you will see here, for the, the secure flag of cookies, we see that only a fraction of the websites, around 10%, is actually using the CQ flag in an experiment we did like one year ago. Also important to see is actually which type of websites are applying. And I don't think it's so surprising that, for instance, you see some of the banks already in that top list. Of course, the top list is relative because if you have 10%, 250 of them are using it. It means that there are a lot of other websites that are not mentioned on this slide also using this technology, of course. For cookies, it's quite simple. It's already been mentioned before, but I think it's interesting to see there's already the first line that you need to do. And we will see a few other topics that you will have to do to secure the browser server communication. To give you a little bit more background on the experiment in which I'm referring to with those pie charts and with those tables, this is actually 2,500 most important websites visits from Belgium. Uh, only 2,449 websites have been responding during our crawl. And from those 2,500 websites that we were actually trying to, to get data of, we inspected around 300,000 pages. Just to give you a flavor, it's a small experiment. We have been doing much larger experiments at university where we say, well, we crawl uh, 10 million pages, we, we crawl uh, 5 million pages, 50 million pages. But this is already giving a good flavor. What is the, the current practice in Belgium? This means if you see those two numbers, around 120 pages per domain. And how do we get to the pages? Well, actually, we ask the search engine Bing for each domain, give us the top uh, list uh, pages, and we limit it to 200. So some domains have up to 200 pages on their domain, but some domains don't have 200 pages indexed by Bing. So that's the reason why we don't have 200 as an average. And from those domains, we see that around 18% of the domains were serving HTTPS, which is in line with the earlier figure that we have between 1% and 25 of the most popular ones. So this is just the background on secure uh, cookies. Let's go further. So even if we have the secure cookie flag set up in our website, we're using TLS, what can go wrong? And the next thing that can go wrong is mixed content. So imagine you have your browser and your server, you're having an HTTPS channel. What can happen is that some of the pages are actually embedding, for instance, JavaScript, or other resources such as an image, such as a style sheet, or other things over HTTP. No big problem. Our session is still HTTPS. Well, in practice, our attacker can come into play here on the HTTP part. So if the attacker is, for instance, able to replace the, uh, the HTTP part, the, the JavaScript being loaded, he's actually able to get that JavaScript fully in control of the network. For instance, if it's a man in the middle, he can really change the JavaScript being delivered to the browser. As I already mentioned in the security model on the first slide, the JavaScript here embedded over HTTP and the website over HTTPS, in the browser, they're running in the same execution context, in the same security context. It means if you actually have access to that JavaScript, you can take it over the client side of this browser, you can impersonate that user, and you can send requests from this browser to the server on behalf of the user you could deface the page. You could actually control that client-side environment. So and even if your browser is thinking he's working over HTTPS, it means that an attacker has access to that application. So this is a little bit horrifying. Let me also give you some uh, rest or, or at least some peace of mind. For most browsers nowadays on the desktop, this will actually already be blocked. Either they will show you that the HTTPS is not safe, or they will block the inclusion of HTTP JavaScript over your application. That's the good part. But I also have bad news, of course. If you're using a mobile browser, your mobile browser will be very happy to fetch the HTTP JavaScript, will execute, and you're still owned. So this is something that you surely have to make sure, as a website developer, that it doesn't happen. And we will see some techniques later on as an additional layer of defense where you can protect against this. But this is something that really can harm your application. And especially all the browsers on the desktop like IE, but also the mobile browsers are still vulnerable for this attack. 
So to give you a little bit more insights in mixed content, because you yeah, have mixed content, you see the problem happening. Is it actually happening in practice? Well, our statistics show that it's happening in practice quite often. So if we, we crawled in this experiment a little bit more domains, we, we actually crawled 100,000 domains, and we, we crawled up to 500,000 pages belonging to those domains. We saw 18,000 SSL protected websites, but 43% of them actually have mixed content, and actually 26% of them <coughs> actually including JavaScript over HTTP, which means that you easily can own them even if they're running over TLS. A little bit more interesting, um, is this actually only for the uh, less popular websites or also the popular websites su uh, suffering from this problem? Well, we tried to plot actually the rank, the popularity rank here. So these are the most popular websites. These are the least popular websites in the top 100,000. And we're actually seeing that the problem of mixed content is kind of the similar over the different uh, popularity ranks. So it means the popularity doesn't have a big impact on the inclusion of uh, mixed content. So we didn't learn that much of this graph. So we tried to see, uh, to figure out are there particular websites that are more vulnerable than other websites in actually having the mixed content problem. So the next thing that we tried out is we have those 100,000 domains. What if we try to plot them based on the category of the type of website that they are delivering? So we're using the McAfee web database and here we're actually doing it per vertical. So we're trying to see which kind of business website is actually being displayed to the end user. Is it, for instance, an uh, entertainment website? Is it a government or military website? Is it a shopping website? Is it a finance website? And based on that, we're actually trying to measure if there are differences between the different websites. And you see, it's a little bit more varying. And actually, it's not so surprising. So one of the things that we saw in this experiment is that the entertainment websites have much more mixed content inclusions. So I think their functionality and interaction with other websites is actually a priority over the security of the website itself. But for government, and I think especially military, we see a drop in the number of mixed content. So I think this is something that we could expect. Something that we didn't expect in, in the data that we saw here is actually banking and finance. We were expecting to see really a drop here in this type of websites, but we still see that also for the banking and the finance sector, we see that the mixed content inclusion problem is still an issue there. And probably this has to do with PR, uh, PR campaigns, activities, not purely by the IT department, that actually also is part of the domain of the bank as well. But this is something that really needs to be improved because it's an issue both on all the browsers on the desktop, but especially on the mobile browsers. Okay, we can fix this. We can make sure that we all have secure inclusions. We can set a secure flag. We can use TLS. Problem fixed. No, this would not be the end of my presentation, of course. We still have some issues that we have to fix within the this interaction between the client and the server. So the problem is actually when we're actually starting to bootstrap, when we are starting to serve to a website, already mentioned by, by uh, Jim, typically what we do is actually we request over HTTP, we are redirected to HTTPS, and then our secret channel is starting to kick off. And this is something, if you just have a URL with even, without the protocol being specified in your browser, you by default will go to HTTP. And how many of you did on a mobile browser even enter the protocol if you're visiting a website? You're just trying a keyword and that's it. So in that sense, there's still some attack vector possible there. Namely, we see some content coming from the web browser to the web server over HTTP. A web attacker could still try to attack that. And they actually do. So to give you a little bit more information, how do you redirect from HTTP to HTTPS for people that are not so familiar with web application development? Well, you could of course say you do it via a header, and this is I think the most common way to redirect you from one protocol to another protocol or from one page to another page. But we see also in practice that websites might be using the meta tag because they don't have access to the headers, for instance. If you have an application themselves, the developer has access to the content in the application, not necessarily to the headers. And also you can do it via JavaScript by actually reloading to HTTPS. So there are different ways. So even if you try to figure out in your own organization how do they actually go from one protocol to the other protocol, don't limit it to checking the headers. So I mentioned the attacker is actually abusing this. Let's look at how this is working. And this is something that Moxie Marlinspike uh, showed in Black Hat 2009. So if your web browser is contacting your website over HTTP, 
and your man in the middle is actually seeing all the traffic and is able to manipulate all the traffic, he's actually being able to forward your HTTP request to the web server. The web server says, okay, good, you're bootstrapping, we will move you to the most secure protocol, HTTPS, and he's actually redirecting the user to HTTPS, but this is intercepted by the malicious uh, attacker, and he's actually transforming this request to make sure that this is back HTTP response. This could be redirect, this could be a little bit saying, well, you have to reload the page or anything else that the browser instructs to continue on HTTP rather than go to HTTPS. From that moment on, the browser will continue to work with HTTP because the, the man in the middle will always translate HTTP to HTTPS, but to the server side, everything will be HTTPS. So this means for the server side, everything is fine because the protocol has been upgraded from HTTP to HTTPS. On the client side, you're still running over HTTP and your man in the middle can still transform all the data coming to you. So you really have a bootstrap problem. Even if your website is using TLS, how do you make sure that actually only HTTPS is being used on your web application? Well, good news. I think two years ago, um, the strict transport security uh, has been introduced as a, a way to actually ensure that your browser is contacting websites over HTTPS. And how does it work? Well, if you're delivering your web application to the client, what you do over the TLS side is actually putting one additional header being part of your application. So this is a response header that's going from the server to the client side, instructing the browser. When you see this header, make sure that you only visit this website in the future over HTTPS. Never issue an HTTP request to my website, only do it over HTTPS, and you also have a max lifespan. In this example, it's very low. Typically, what they're requesting in order to, do it, uh, to improve the website, when you test a few things out, is three months, six months, or even a year that you say you instruct a browser of, of someone visiting your website, and the next year, never visit my website again over HTTP. So you're actually instructing the browser, if you are actually contacting this domain in the future, never, never contact me over HTTP. And this also means in the browser itself, HTTP request or by default blocked or transformed to HTTPS. What's also interesting, if you actually are maintaining a set of domains, you can use the include subdomains option to actually say it's not only for this domain, but for all the domains you will see in my uh, company. So I think this is a very interesting technology because here you're really saying if you have regular visitors, they're actually sitting at home, they're visiting your website, but now they're, for instance, here at the faculty club, yeah, well, you can actually instruct them to only visit your website in the future over HTTPS. So even if Moxie is sitting here and transforming with this pineapple you from HTTP to HTTPS and trying to transform all the requests, your browser will never issue an HTTP request, so you will not be vulnerable anymore. So what is the state of practice? Actually, good news. Um, with uh, the event of the new Internet Explorer, actually all major browsers are supporting it. So if you already have Chrome and Firefox, Opera already for a long time, um, now also IE is on board as well. But this is actually really the way forward to say, if you have an HTTPS website, you tested it for some period of time, there's no reason not to include that header in your application. Of course, you have to make sure that your SSL connection is stable. Because in the period of time you have the, the lifespan of your header, there's no fallback to say, well, we have problems with SSL or, or with the, the Hill PKI system, we revert back to HTTP, it's not longer an option. You really have to go for HTTPS from then on. If you're looking to the user statistics, we see around 4% using it on the Belgium, uh, from Belgium out in websites, but we see that most of the websites actually using it are global websites. Um, I think Airbnb, the Belgian one, but all those are actually international companies. We hope to see a much longer list within the near future. And this is something that we, I really would like to propagate. If you have an HTTP website that you want to transform to HTTPS, don't forget this header. Okay. The, the mobile? Um, I, I will show you a link at the end of the presentation. I'm not sure. So I, I can't say for sure. I think the Chrome one is doing. I'm not sure for, for instance, Safari on iOS. I, I, I must be honest, I don't know it by heart. But I will show you a link. It's called caniuse.com. And for most of the technology I present today, you can actually see with caniuse.com, is this technology supported on which browser platform? Also, this can help to decide if you know which type of users are actually accessing your website, you may say this is interesting or not interesting, depending on your users. Um, also, if you say, well, we have a large group of users still working on IE6 or IE8, this might help you to, to, to actually pick the right technologies for your company. 
but this is uh, included in my slides, and I will also show you one slide at the end of my presentation. But this is a very good question. So don't believe all those numbers that I put up here, which version of Chrome or Firefox supporting it. You can really look, is that the version and that version supported? And if you combine that with all the analytics information you already have about your websites, you can easily see for my website this means that those and those technologies are widely supported by the users. Those and those technologies might be too, too new to actually be mainstream. Good question. So, okay, we have, now have HTTPS. Uh, we actually forced the browser to use HTTPS. I think we're fine, right? Well, there's still two things that might be interesting. So one thing is we still have the, the preloading part. So the first time you visit your website here, you're going from HTTP to HTTPS. This is not so favorable, right? Because it means that you can still be attacked the first time you're visiting a website. So if I say, well, you have to go to GitHub or whatever website that I'm mentioning here and it's actually having that transformation, people starting to search here. I have my pineapple here and I can actually intercept all the traffic later on in your sessions. I can see which password you're using and so on. So what you can do, and, and this was also mentioned by Jim, you can actually ask the browsers to preload your configuration as part of the browser. And Chrome has a, 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 a form where you actually can say, my website now supports HSTS. Please include it in the preload list of the browser. And that means that your browser will actually be preloaded with a long list of domains that will never be visited over HTTP. And there's actually some collaboration ongoing. So if you have the list that this Chrome is, will be using, also Firefox is actually adopting the same list and other browsers are actually following as well. So it means if you want to get in that preloaded list, the bootstrap problem actually is getting fixed. Um, the only requirement to get in the bootstrap is, of course, you need to run H HSTS. You have to act, think, uh, have forward secrecy on for your encryption protocols, your cipher suits in TLS. And you also need, I think, at least three months of lifespan that your uh, HSTS will be uh, allowed. So the, the max age that was mentioned in the header should at least be three months so that they know it's not something that you set up th this week and next week it's gone. It's really something long term on your web application. Uh, so how is this scalable? How do you mean? Uh, so how, how will they be able to, to, to pull this off? I think it's a kind of promotion. So I think they will tr they're, they're trying to get some, as many as possible preloaded lists because this means the technology gets adopted. But indeed, you can't say, well, we have millions and millions of websites and they all need to be preloaded. There might be some next step. But I think also the, the, the ideas of Google there is they want to see the whole web migrating to HTTPS and they're really pushing that. So they're trying to, see, uh, to, to show that performance is no longer a penalty. Also with Speedy, they actually has HTTPS as default, which is now a little bit uh, um, reduced in, in HTTP2 specifications but they really want to push HTTPS. And I think this is part of this, this idea. And if you go to Speedy or HTTP2, and you actually can already instruct browser to be a default HTTPS, then you don't longer need the HTTP, uh, uh, HSTS preload list because then your browser will first contact you over HTTPS and might fall back to HTTP. So I think this is the long-term idea. So nobody of Google mentioned this, so this is one of my guesses in, in, in the strategy. But I think, indeed, it's not scalable if a lot of websites are, are, are trying to do that. But I think it's, it's really a promotional way of actually, if you are actually using this technology, we will help you one step further. And I think that, that makes sense. And I, I would really encourage you to, to be able to do that. But before doing the preload, make sure that HSTS is working fine on your domain for some period of time. Um, just make sure that no, no, no users are complaining, that you don't see anything bad going on because HTTPS was not reachable anymore. OK, other questions? Okay, so one of the things we didn't solve in, in all those technologies on the communication between client and server, which is back a hot topic since last week, I think, is the way how CAs and PKIs are working. Um, so we had some incidents in the past where CAs or authorities were not being trusted or being hacked. They might not even issue their own CAs into your computer like by Superfish. What if you don't trust other CAs running in your browser? Jim showed you how many CAs already are pre-configured in your browser. So you have to trust actually all those CAs in order to deliver the right security level for your web application. So is there anything you can do? Well, yes, you can do. You can actually have a fingerprint of your own certificates on the server side and make sure that they are delivered to the client side as well. And similar to the previous technology, you're actually instructing with the public key pinning, this is the fingerprint of my certificates for this domain. Please store them on the client side for some period of time and never, never interact with me 
if another certificate is presented. So this means if some agency has access to, to wildcard certificates or actually having their own authority installed in your browser, this should actually prevent them from accessing your website. Because the browser, for some period of time, will actually verify that the fingerprint of the certificate is listed in one of the configuration files in previous requests to your website. Again, you can include subdomains. Also an interesting feature is the report URI. Un unlike the other technologies which are already stable and a lot of support in many browsers, this technology is really kicking off. So this is really only supported well in Chrome, and I think the latest build of Firefox also includes some fraction of the key pinning in their uh, technology. I think the advice that Jim was giving on using report your UI for the moment is a good advice because then at least it gives you insights in how it's actually being processed on the clients already uh, having that information, but you don't enforce it at this moment. I, I think this is a good one ste first step in actually applying this uh, technology, but I hope that this technology might get further in the near future. So one of the things I have to mention about this key pinning is you see two fingerprints here, and this is also something that is required by the specification. You can't say I only have one certificate and I'm pinning that certificate, because if you actually revoke that certificate, your website is actually offline for some period of time. Actually, the whole age that you're providing here, your website will not be accessible once you actually are revoking your certificate, because for instance, there's something stolen, something went wrong. So the advice that they actually give in the specification and uh, by the committee is actually specifying those technology is that you have multiple certificates for your company, that you actually save them very sec uh, securely so that you don't have to use, you only have to use one at a time, but that you actually at least have some fallbacks in your, in your company that if one has to, has to be revoked, that immediately another certificate can take over and the fingerprint is already known by the users. So this is one of the things that you have to take into account. One of the things that you need to take into account that you need at least more than one certificate for your domain. And secondly, that you have to make sure that you actually start it very securely so it's not good to have them both at the same Apache, for instance. One side note, um, I was mentioning Superfish to actually promote this technology. I also have to be honest. Uh, if you're having Chrome and you had Superfish, you were not protected by this technology. And this is actually a drawback of the current implementation. So even the fact that you are actually checking the fingerprints or the certificates, you don't do it for certificates that are locally installed. And already Jim mentioned this. It, it, it's probably one of the ways you actually can incorporate it easier in your, in your uh, organization where you might have your own CA certificate to do interception, to do also some monitoring of your network. But what I see in this technology is it's really a drawback because this is not what you expect to happen in this technology. You don't expect that if a fingerprint is supplied by the server, that the client side still ignores the fingerprint and is uh, using a local certificate. But this is something that probably now, once the, 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 the whole hassle around Superfish is being settled, that also will uh, have an impact on how the implementation will improve in the near future. At least that's my hope. I saw some questions. Dieter? Does this mean that you uh, have to buy multiple certificates from a certificate authority just for one site? Isn't that like very expensive? It depends. So also you could say, well, you, for instance, depending on your organization, the type of certificate you're actually deploying, you could say, well, we have an extended verification for the main certificate, but we might have a cheaper certificate as fallback. Just in, in at the moment, we're actually having an attack and the certificate with extended verification get compromised, we at least can fall back with another CA. Also, I don't think it's a bad idea for large organizations to have multiple CAs actually signing certificates. Because if one CA gets compromised, like DigiNotar, for instance, suddenly there's a push from the browser to actually uh, remove that certificate from your certificate chain. At that moment, you want your organization still to be reachable. But I think it really depends on the type of organization, the size of your organization, what is, is useful or not. So I don't have enough insights to see if companies are actually having multiple certificates for their organization. But I can imagine that this, this is not a bad idea to actually have a kind of uh, at least a fallback scenario in case a certificate gets compromised or revoked. And probably all the people in the audience might have a bit of insights on that as well. Yeah, I think you also have to balance it like, okay, what's the cost of writing the actual, uh, certificate? Versus what's the damage to your business? 
if you get compromised. Yeah. Yeah. So we can have like one certificate for like 100 or 500 euro a year, Co compared to if I'm 10 minutes out of business and it costs me like 10,000 of euro. I, I think this is kind of, of the way you have to, to look at it. I, I think it's also reputation, depending on your business, being unreachable for some period of time might have an, a huge impact on your business and your rep reputation. But I think it's really depending on the organization. I could imagine if you're running a blog that you probably will not use this technology and having two certificates. You probably will not even have your certificates yourself. You might even use other technology being the front end of your application. So it, it really depends on the organization, I think. But good question. So, and with that, I actually, at, I'm at the end of actually securing the client side server side communication. So, we saw the use of TLS. I reminded you of mixed content inclusions. I will show you in the next session, uh, next part, how you can actually protect against that. With the secure flag, I think this is kind of obvious how to, to use that. I think HSTS is really an enabler. If you have TLS, you should really take the next step and have HSTS on your domains as well. But this, of course, means that you're only running your website over HTTPS. If you have a mixed mode where you're running your website over HTTP and HTTPS, this is a different scenario. Maybe then it's useful to actually have the TLS website on a separate subdomain. And public keeping, I think, for now, it might be a little bit early, but this is certainly something you have to watch in the near future. I would not recommend you to do it tomorrow already. I would first focus on the other topics in securing client side and server side. So before I go to the script injections, are there any questions on this first part of the presentation? Okay, good. There are either two possibilities, it was all clear or everyone is asleep. But let's assume that it's all clear. Um, we're going to the script injection. And I promise I'm not going to redo the whole presentation that, that Jim did on advanced XSS because I think he's really the expert on cross-site scripting. Um, I want to just show you how you actually can tune a few things in uh, the server-side policies to work on the client side, but I will m give a little more, more attention on how you use CSP in your application. So cross-site scripting, uh, it's a no-brainer, I think you already saw at least this week or even before many presentations already on how cross-site scripting is working. You have some payload, for instance, on the server-side, it gets downloaded to the victim and actually it produces some execution controlled by the attacker. We want to limit that and there are different technologies. One technology to actually prevent cookies, which is not a prevention technique against cross-site scripting, but in case cross-site scripting is happening, this HTTP-only flag can make sure that your cookies are preserved from being read by the malicious script. So what it does is actually instructing your browser, just like secure does, send it only over HTTPS. HTTP only says, you can use this cookie for interaction with the server, but if you are actually requesting from JavaScript what are the cookies or you want to set the cookie by JavaScript, you will no longer be allowed. So you only use it for inf uh, interaction between the client and the server, but in the JavaScript context, your cookies are not available. So it mitigates the cross-site scripting impact on session cookies. It does not mitigate cross-site scripting in the browser. And cookies is one way to exploit cross-site scripting and have something useful in your browser, but you could also do a lot of other things when you have cross-site scripting. You could trigger new requests to the server, um, you could, uh, for instance, uh, use some APIs that, that, for instance, access the camera, like I will see tomorrow in the WebRTC session. You could try to, to fingerprint the user. So there are many other things that are useful on the client side. Cookies is only one fraction of the things. But the, the hackers will typically, this is the quick win. If you have the cookie, then you can just install it on your own browser and re-impersonate the, uh, the person. But if you have the cross-site scripting and even no access to the cookies, you easily install Beef and then you actually can do any exploit you want in the browser of the victim. So it's a really a first step, but don't trust too much on the HTTP only. Apply it to make it a little bit harder for the attacker, but that's it. That's my advice. So um, for session cookies, it's a no-brainer. You should really enable it for session cookies. There is no reason if you have a framework on the server side that using sessions, why JavaScript on the client side would be able to read your session cookies. It's something that the browser needs to actually say, I'm part of the same session on the server side, so leave it that way. JavaScript should not interact with that. And I think by default, a lot of frameworks now are moving towards HTTP only and secure by default in their configuration. This technology is a little older. I think it's from 2007, 2006, 2007. I think first introduced by Microsoft. And you see the adoption rate is higher. 
around 35% of the websites are actually using this technology. And this is also something you will notice throughout the slides. Once uh, it's a little bit, uh, the technology is longer in place, the adoption rate will, will increase as well. And this is a quite easy fix. And this is something that typically is not fixed only by the developers configuring the application. It's typically frameworks slowly adopting new technology and improving some of the security state in the framework. And HTTP only is a good example of that as well. Then the next thing, there's the XSS protection header in the browser. This is a kind of special case. So all the technology I presented in the rest of my presentation is actually you as a server owner trying to increase the security on the client side. With the XSS protection header, which is actually uh, being used to control how some cross-site scripting attacks are mitigated in the browser, it's a little bit reverse. In most browsers, this is on by default, but it gives you some option to configure it, what, what happens on the client side. So it's only protecting against one particular part of cross-site scripting, namely reflected cross-site scripting. So stored and, and uh, DOM-based will not be uh, hampered by that. And don't trust too much on it because there are a lot of multi uh, bypasses being reported. And I think even people in this audience have already produced bypasses for the XSS protection. So in that sense, it's one thing that is enabled in the browser. It's good to know what it is, but it's already on by default, so don't take too much time in configuring this. What can you configure? Well, you have three things. The basic one, if you don't mention it, it's already on by default. It's actually saying, make sure that XSS protection is on. And what does it do? It tries to see in the URL if some data is actually reoccurring from the URL in the page itself and executing a script, that script will not be executed in your page. So if you have a reflected cross-site scripting in the URL, there's some parameter that is actually script alert or anything else. There is some uh, tactics in the browser that will try to detect it's in the URL. It's also causing to execute that script in the, in the page itself, so we will not execute it because it's actually a, cross, a reflected cross-site scripting attack. For some websites, it might actually break your functionality. They offered to opt out for that particular page, for that particular website, for this technology. This is the, the zero. So I, I would not recommend to use that zero. What's the only thing that might be interesting on the configuration is the block mode. So whenever you have a reflected cross-site scripting, if the, the, the mode of operation in your page will actually try to figure out which script should not be executed, it still shows you the rest of the page. And in some cases, it's more opportune to say, well, rather than showing the rest of the page, you don't want that page to be shown in the browser at any time, maybe because you, you find out one cross-site scripting, but you know that you're under attack, maybe you would just want to block the rest of the page anyway. And this is something you can configure. So if you do something of configuration on the XSS protection header, just you can add the block mode, which means you don't render the page at all. You just give a warning that something is wrong with that application. So this is my advice on using the XSS protection header. So the statistics are a little bit skewed because since it's already on by default, I wouldn't say that the red is really bad because those websites might just rely on the standard protection. So we see around 4%. And I think, again, it's our frameworks that are configuring the option to be set. Good. And now we're really starting with the interesting part, cross a content security policy. So the content security policy. I think this was mentioned by Jim already in a little bit more detail, also mentioned by, by Philip. What it actually does, you might already know, I will quickly repeat, but I'll also show you how you configure your website and we'll give you some examples how to configure your website with CSP and what you can do with it. So the idea of content security policy. Again, the same uh, tactic. You actually issue a response header as part of your application. The client side sees this as part of your application and this is actually the security policy that will be enforced on that particular page. What it does is actually controlling which resources are allowed to be loaded as part of your web, web application, your web page. So if you have images in there, if you have style sheets, if you have, for instance, Flash or Java or videos, you can actually configure which resources are allowed to be included in your page, which resources are not allowed to be included in your page. And this is the basic setup of the content security policy. So you are the one deciding what's actually being part of your website, what's not part of your website. Why is this important? Well, a lot of the attacks that happened, for instance, on including JavaScript 
will start with one small part of JavaScript being injected in your application, but they typically will fetch remote JavaScript to be loaded in your page. Or they will have a fragment of inline JavaScript, and with content security policy, you can say inline JavaScript never gets executed on my web application. And this is the reason why CSP is really a good enabler, an additional layer of defense in protecting against cross-site scripting. And we will see some of the directives and we'll understand what does, why this is actually useful in configuring in your application. So I say additional layer. I still think all the mitigation techniques against cross-site scripting like uh, input validation, output validation, or, or step up a kill, I would really encourage you to actually take the best practices there. But once you have an application, I think it makes sense, certainly in newly developed applications, to have an additional layer of defense that says, even if an application might miss one or two things in the configuration, new attacks, maybe CSP will be an additional layer of protecting of uh, scripts that I was not expecting in my page to be executed as part of my application. So, what are the directives? And with the directives, I'm actually referring to the version of uh, February last year. Um, last week, there was an update. Not only version 1.1 is actually being enrolled, but also CSP level 2 is being enrolled. And I will briefly mention during the presentation what are the differences between 1.1 and 1.2, and, and 2.0. The default is actually, you always work by saying what are the sources that are allowed to be included in my web application. And if I already showed you the previous example, you already have a directive here, which actually says, for instance, scripts, you can only do it from the website itself. And objects like Flash and Java, you do it from no website. So typically, CSP will always work with a directive and then a source list from what are the different origins that are allowed to be included in my application. If you don't want to specify it for each different resource separately, you take the default source, and this is actually for all the resources, they have the same limitation on what can be loaded in your application. What can you specify? We saw already in the previous example, self and none, but you can also have a space separated list of origins. So you can have different origins, uh, which is the triple between a protocol, a domain, and a port, and you can actually specify what of those origins are allowed to provide scripts or images or style sheets and so on. There are actually kind of liberate in the way you can actually specify the source list. So you can actually have a store for the protocol. You could say only the protocol is specified. You could easily include wildcards for subdomains. So it's kind of a very liberate way of specifying your origins. What is the difference with uh, 2.0? Actually, here it's limited to origins. In the new version of CSP, you could even be more fine-grained, and you could even say parts of pages itself. So you could be much more restrictive rather than saying, I'm really trusting that whole domain. You can actually say, I'm trusting that subpart of the domain, or for instance, these pages of the domain, or those resources of the domain explicitly, and all the rest I disallow as well. Which might be interesting for some domains, like GitHub, that might have user-generated content quite easily as subparts of the domain. Good. What are now the directives that you want to zoom in? So if you don't use the default source, what are the things you can set? Well, you can say where scripts can be loaded from, where objects like Flash and other plugins are loaded from, style sheets, images, video and audio. You can say which frames you are allowed to embed in your application, so which frames you actually can load as part of iframes within your application. You could say where fonts can come from, and connect source is the way around to which websites you can connect. And this is a subset of all the directives. I don't think it makes sense to go over all the details of all the directives in this session, but I just want to give you a flavor what you really can do with CSP. One thing is, I'm very positive here over CSP and you can limit what happens on your website. On the downside, I also have to say, well, you can only use CSP in a reasonable way if your website is behaving. And of course, the question is, what is behaving? And actually, there are some limitations. And the first limitation is actually already quite strict. You're not longer allowed in your application to have inline scripts or inline CSS. This means if you have a legacy application with a lot of event handlers directly written into your application, if you have a lot of script tags actually being coded directly in the web pages themselves, it will be a very hard time of actually converting your application to be CSP compliant. In the same setting, 
um, I think it's a good idea to actually do the separation between your, your um, layout and your coding. So actually, I encourage you to split scripts and, and CSS away from your, 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 your web view itself. But on the other hand, converting that for legacy applications might be a burden in actually getting CSP deployed. And the second thing that has an impact, and especially on the scripts you're using or third party scripts you're using, you're no longer allowed to use eval because actually eval could include, again, a lot of uh, script injections into your application that CSP is actually blocking in your application. So if you take one step back, I think CSP is a very interesting technology, but those two requirements of actually to behave might have quite some impact on the deployment or the adoption rate. To give you a little bit more flavor of what does it mean on an application, this is a very simple snap, a sn snippet of an application. Well, you have some inline scripts in your page, you have an event handler. What does it mean to actually rewrite your application? Well, your page itself becomes much more simpler, much cleaner. You say, well, I include the script which is actually having the dynamics in my application, and I just have my link here without any event handler being attached to it. Of course, it means that you have to write the external script, which having the same JavaScript code as before. But now you also need the binding to the page where you're actually all adding the event handlers to the, the specific topics in your page. And this code might be a little bit more clumsy to write. On the other hand, it also makes sure that even if this is evolving, you can much more easily say, well, we're having the same code attached to multiple pages. We actually are all in control of the binding itself of the page. But it means that if you have a web page, a large web page written like this, it will not be easy to convert it in this way. And also, that's one of the reasons why I think CSP is a very interesting technology. And, but I mentioned in the beginning, I think it's an interesting technology if you can start with a new application. So if you have, have quite a control of how the application will be developed, what libraries will be included, this might be a very interesting way to actually build up your application because that separation between code and your page itself is already in, uh, enforced in a lot of frameworks you're using. But it also helps you to actually get CSP deployed as well. Okay, so we have those limitations and also the people of CSP are aware of those limitations having a big impact on applications. There are some relaxations to be used to say, well, our website does not behave, but maybe we are still interested in CSP. So one thing you can do is say, well, from this script origin, these sources that you have here, I allow to have unsafe inline for the scripts. This means at that moment when you specify this um, statement, you're still allowed to have inline scripts in your application. They will not be blocked. Yeah, you can do it for, um, wait, I, have an I have an example for the style sheets as well, where you can say unsafe inline for the style sheets as well. But of course, while you're actually breaking down uh, what, are, what, what are the requirements are for CSP, you're actually relaxing them. Be very careful if you're using those, because if your main uh, idea is I want to protect against cross-site scripting, by actually allowing the unsafe inline or the unsafe eval, you could have back a situation where it's quite easy to exploit cross-site scripting on a web application. So I think these relaxations are useful, but I will show you in a minute why they might be very useful. But I would say if it's really your intention to protect against cross-site scripting, you should not consider those relaxations, and you should mainly consider CSP for your newly built application rather than a legacy application to be converted. Are relaxations safer than not using them? Um, I will show you some examples where they are safer. I think in general, if you say, well, uh, generally I want to protect against cross-site scripting, I would not use the relaxations because if you're all... It's better than not using the content security policy at all. Depends. Um, if you say, I have the unsafe in, in line here, it means any protection you're doing to make sure that a user embedded scripts are not executed is gone. Because any part of your page that still has a script in injected by the user will be executed. So you're actually losing immediately that assessment. If you say, well, I, I still want to block uh, flash objects I am not aware of being included in my application, it can help you one step. But it's, much, uh, it, it's quite easy. If you still allow JavaScript to be included, well, you probably can't get around this, the basic guarantees that will be provided by CSP. So actually, any of those relaxations give you a way to actually circumvent the basic property CSP wa wants to, to, to offer you. 
but I will show you why it still might be useful in some cases to use the relaxations. Other questions at this moment? No, good. So one notice, there might be a lot of applications that have inline scripts and you don't want to convert them all. Also people at CSP, uh, working on CSP, or actually acknowledging that. And since version 1.1, you could use nonces as well, which means if you have a nonce being declared in the header of your application, and this would be something really issued case by case, user by user, so it's not something be that the attacker can read easily for all their users on your application. You can use that nonce in the script, and this is actually giving a wildcard to still execute this script. So this might be a better way than using the relaxations, because with the relaxations you don't have any means of actually protecting against cross-site scripting. Now you can say, well, if I carefully write the script here, an attacker cannot execute in a similar way because he doesn't know the nonce. So in that sense, you're better protected against an attacker. So I think this is much better than using a relaxation for legacy domains. But still, it means that you will have to rewrite the code of your application to actually issue a nonce and also to include the nonces on the scripts. But if you say we have a few pages where scripts are really important to be there and nobody dares to touch, this might be one way to actually being able to run them. You could also actually include a hash of uh, the script itself. So in this case, I want to include this script. I could actually say this hash is allowed on my page. I think it's an interesting case that you could do that, but I don't expect a lot of pages to actually include a lot of hashes on the scripts that I want to include because also once you have code in your application, it might evolve and you always need to sync between what is the specific hash for this uh, part in my application and the hash being specified in the header. So I So you can have multiple hashes, all source delimited. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it, this can be useful if you say, I know that, for instance, my application is generating some scripts in the page. Mm -hmm. I could say at the server side, I could already filter that information and create the hashes. But be very careful because the moment you're actually having a filter doing that, you must be really sure that you're actually doing it on your own scripts and not something that is already injected by the attacker. So it's, it's always kind of, you have to balance what you can do. So I think this one is useful to include as part of your, your application itself, and then you, have a kind of, you need a kind of synchronization mechanism to make sure that you always have new nonsense and that they are synced. Mm -hmm. I think for this part, I, I'm less convinced that this is actually something that can help you, but I might be mistaken, so I, I want to hear some good information on how to use it. Dieter? Are there currently already tools that do this automatically server side, like for your own scripts that you're sure are in row? Uh, include the hash or a nonce, so you don't have to do this manually or... So I know that there are tools, there are research papers, there are some small scripts trying to do that. I'm not aware that actually one of those tools is already production ready. Um, I, I think it might evolve rapidly, but I think it's better rather than having a separate tool. I think it, it makes more sense to say, well, your framework is supporting a way already to, to provide this to you, but if your framework is already capable of doing this, I think the next step should be not using this, but using CSP in its full mode, not trying to mitigate around some of the limitations. But, but, but I could imagine, for instance, if you say, well, I need to include, for instance, um, jQuery is, not, is a bad example because it's CSP compliant or can be CSP compliant. But if you say, I need to include a script from a third party provi a provider that has, for instance, some of, of the features that are not behaving well, you might uh, say, well, I relax it because this is a, is a way to include it. But I think it's better to just say, well, we use it more for newly developed applications and we take the full CSP way. That, that's my view on it. I think that if you look at in the deal world, and if yeah. you see our website is, let's say, 10 years of history and 50 legacy applications, yeah. and you want to start protecting those in a cost-effective way, then maybe the non way is the best way to go. Yeah, but then again, I, I would not protect the whole application. I might focus on small supports of the application. And then probably, li like Philip was mentioning yesterday, it might make sense to actually isolate some s p topics in the subdomain, or actually having some boundary around it, and focus to actually get those nonces or CSP, full CSP, actually applied on that part, rather than actually trying to fix the whole application. Because if you have large applications, it's not that simple to actually fix it. So we had most of students trying, for instance, for things like PHP, MyAdmin, to, to, to update it to be CSP compliant, and it's not trivial to do. 
I saw another question. Yeah. Yeah. So in that sense, um, I think with with the first example, the nonce, I think it might be okay. I think the second one, if you have multiple hashes, it, it quickly. I, I think it's like 250, uh, 65 or uh, 256 or, or, or 512. Indeed, that might be an issue. Uh, it, it depends. You could be right. I, I didn't try it a lot of uh, those things. I already tried some of the nonces and they worked. So in the browser I was using. It might also be that the people working, for instance, in the teams like Chrome and Firefox might also be aware that the, the response header might be, become longer because more and more security technology is using the headers to push policies, and policies get larger and larger over time. Okay. So interesting to see how it will behave. So also that's an interesting remark. You might not only want to focus on the, the browser that's actually adopting the technology, you also might to see what's the impact on the browsers not supporting the technology yet. And, and one of the older browsers might be an example that is impacted by this technology. Good. One thing I... I sure. The definition of the... Do you have any other path? Yeah, in CSP uh, level 2, you can actually add a path rather than only an origin. To, to apply the nonce only on the specific... Yeah. So... Um, the next step, we have CSP. What I think is one of the most, uh, the most interesting contributions of CSP in the whole security pushed back to the client is actually the way you report features. So the way you actually can say, well, I'm running CSP, but I don't use it just to prevent certain things from happening, but I use it as a monitor to detect certain things going on on the client side. And I think this is a very interesting feature. Even if your website cannot be fully protected by CSP, because it might have some uh, insecure things. It might be interesting to see if you see certain things happening on the client side that you were not expecting, to see some inclusions that you were not expecting, to see that certain evals were being used on, the, on applications over time. And the reporting feature is a, a very good way to do that. By putting CSP in reporting mode, it will do the same checks as it would be doing in the normal prevention way, but rather than actually blocking some executions on the client side, it will just phone home to the server and say, I have noticed those violations on visiting this website on this uh, browser. And I think this is actually a very interesting way because we did lose a lot of control on the security on the client side. Because once you push your application to the client side, it's gone. You might see some requests coming back, but that's it. Now, and now, now we see more and more uh, web technology being pushed to the client side and giving report modes actually brings us back a little bit more in control. We can install some monitors on the client side that report back to the server. And this is, for instance, interesting because you might not be fully aware of what's going on in your application. So there were studies from people in uh, the US that were having uh, pages under their control. They were including advertisements on their pages. And they saw that the advertisements actually got replaced by ISPs, for instance. This is something, as a server owner, you're not aware what is happening in your application. But all of a sudden, you see that instead of your Google ad provider, suddenly another ad provider is actually replacing all your ads, for instance. And then you can actually see what's going on on this specific application running in this particular organization. You could also see, for instance, a corporate firewall is actually mangling with my application and making certain things not to work. With the report mode, you actually get a better feeling what resources are being included, what resources have been replaced, is there any attack going on on the client side. And report mode gives you more information than you would ever be able to capture on the server side alone. So I think it's a good add-on to collect data. On the other side, if a lot of data reports coming in re report mode, you can on the one hand be DDoSed because a lot of reports are coming in all at the same time. Secondly, you also need an infrastructure. Logging is not enough. You also need to process the logs. And also this takes, of course, quite some resources. So it's actually a good way of, on the one hand, fine tuning the policies you need for CSP and from time to time have a snapshot what's really going on with my application on the client side executions. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. So it, it, you can't push it yet to the existing big data analytics. Uh, I'm not aware of any technology already mining those things. Uh, wh what you typically get, you get a post with, and I will, will show that um, here. You get a post back with a report in JSON. But the way you process the JSON or you store the JSON is something up to the application. I'm not aware of any 
Splunk plugin or anything else that already is processing this uh, reports. So how do you use the report mode? Actually, you mention a report URI directive to say, well, this is the URL where you will be posting your um, report. And in uh, the content security policy itself, you're just mentioning that you want to be reported. So here, this is the normal content security policy, where you say, I'm enforcing, but at the same time, I want to get also the reports of what's going on on the client side. You could also say, I'm running the content security policy in report only mode. So this means it will not be enforced. It will only be verified and send back the report, but the, the execution will be not uh, influenced in any way by your policy. And certainly, if you want to use CSP at any moment in time on your application, be sure to run it for some time in the report only mode to see how the, the clients are actually reacting on your application in processing your policy, because you might want to want to fine tune your policy later on in the application. OK, before we continue with some uh, CSP examples, are there any remaining questions on CSP you want to trigger now? Uh, some things that were not clear, some things that you will say, in my organization, I want to know how this or this is working. Go ahead. In terms of the reporting, is it an all or nothing setting? In other words, can I phase the reporting in over time? So I'm saying, all right, let's go CSP, but be very permissive because we, we're phasing it in. Yeah. And then say, okay, I'm going to focus on the next thing. So I only want to turn on reporting for these features, but I'm going to have CSP all for those features. Or is it report everything or enforce everything as well? So, Honestly, I'm, I'm, I think you can't have multiple content security policy headers in the same application. So I think it's actually the report mode is for the whole specification you have in your policy. What I would actually um, encourage you to, to try out is if you say, well, we have already a basic policy that is working quite well, rather than saying, well, I will do report mode on the new policy for my whole set of users, I, I would rather use the, the better deployment of, of Google as a kind of inspiration to say, well, I'm selecting some, a few users and getting reports back from them. Because the, the report itself will actually say on which directive it was, was violated. So you will still do the whole reporting for all the directives you set, but you will get information back which directive was actually violating your policy. But I would not do it for all users because then I, I really think you get a lot of information back. If you're really fine-tuning your policy, it makes more sense to say, well, I select one out of thousand requests to actually have the policy and see what's coming back in, and then we can gradually increase to see if multiple browsers are supporting and so on. Okay. So some examples. Um, I have four examples mentioned here. The first one is actually locking down an application, just the basic features. Why do you actually include the resources? The second one is an interesting case because how you could actually deploy CSP technology to achieve the same level of guarantees you get with uh, running your website fully over HTTPS. So how could you protect your website against mixed content inclusions, even if they're all mixed content inclusions in your application? And this is an interesting case because in reporting mode, it could already help you to say which of your applications are suffering from uh, mixed content inclusions. Then we see some examples on using social media integration just to see how complex uh, a directive can, can become. And I have a snapshot of Facebook which was trying out um, the content security policy two years ago, and it gives you a real impression of how big policies can grow in the real world. So the lockdown of mybank.net, so I don't own that bank, I'm not rich, so <laughs> I have to mention that. Uh, what, what you can do with my bank, you say, well, we know that all the scripts, images, and style sheets are delivered by RCDN. This is something you can have Akamai, you can have a special domain, subdomain, delivering all your data. Actually, you don't expect any script, image, or style sheet to run on your main application coming from somewhere else. You say, I'm doing a lot of XHR because I have a, uh, a single page application, like we'll mention later on by Flip this afternoon. Well, you know, this is the REST API that they will contact to. They will do XHR to that request, to that uh, domain. And you say, well, iframes, I use some iframes, but only load iframes from my domain itself. So don't load any remote iframe, don't load any iframe with advertisement, and so on. And you don't want any Java or Flash running in your bank, and I think this is a good idea either. So how does the policy look like? Well, default is a good idea to say, well, the default source is none. This means if you don't specify, you don't allow anything to be loaded at all in your application. And this is a kind of a, a deny all uh, backup filter in your firewall or default filter in your firewall. This is the thing I would really like to mention. 
this would be the start of your policy. And then you can gradually grow. So you can say for the scripts, the styles, and the images, use your CDN. To connect back to the REST API, use this uh, origin. And for the frames, the child sources should only come from the domain itself. This is what the self means. So this is one example of having this lockdown of my bank. And this is something that was introduced by Mike West in this article online, HTML5 Rocks. And this is something I also would like to encourage you. This is actually a very good document to read up on the content security policy. So the second example, and I think this is one inspiring to actually see the other problems like mixed content, how to monitor it on your existing websites. Well, this is one of the ways you can do it. You can say, well, the default source is HTTPS. This means whatever I'm running of resources in my application, only the protocol HTTPS is allowed. So if I have an object, if I have a style sheet, if I have a JavaScript, an image, only HTTPS will be allowed, HTTP will not be contacted. Of course, your website might not be CSP ready, so you might have some relaxations on saying, well, the scripts are also needed to be run over HTTPS, but you're allowed to be unsafe. The same for the style sheets, they might be in line, but you're sure that they only run over HTTPS. And this is what I mean, it can be useful to, do, to use some relaxations to monitor all the behavior of your website. I'm not using the CSP here to protect against cross-site scripting, I'm using the CSP here to know that my domain is really loading all the content over HTTPS. Reason why this becomes more and more important, like I mentioned before in the mixed content mode, uh, websites, web browsers now already are actively already blocking some of the resources that are loaded over HTTP, and I think in the near future more browsers will do that. So actually not protecting against mixed content might actually turn your website in not accessible for some parts. So I think this is, might be a good, interesting policy if you want to try it on small application units in your domain just to test if mixed content is a problem. This might be an interesting way to try out a content security policy. And you only need a few web, uh, web browsers supporting it. You don't need all your users to support it because if you put it in report only mode, you only want to get some reports back to, to know whether there are actually violations to the mixed content. Obviously, this is one way to secure. I think it's a better way to make sure that all your mixed content is gone in your application and only a subset of the browsers are supporting the CSP, especially all the older browsers like the older IEs will not support it. It means that it's actually just a monitoring mode to see do we have a problem, but we still need to fix it in the code in the application itself. Good. To give a little bit more flavor, uh, we have an application that is really socially well integrated. We have media with Google+, Facebook and Twitter. Some of them are using scripts or, or iframes. How do we look it uh, up in uh, the content security policy? Well, we say the scripts, you see it's delimited by spaces. You have multiple origins allowed for the scripts. You have multiple origins allowed for the, the frames as well. And so all the code examples in my slide deck are all one line. So they might have multiple lines here just to display it but it's one response header in your application. You don't need any new line, any break in uh, specifying the policy. I think this is quite obvious if you saw the directives before. Um, I just want to mention that it can become quite hard to do it for your application. So for instance, this is something that Facebook was issuing a few years ago. So we were only able to capture it once while visiting Facebook. And we tried a lot of times again to actually see what content security policies that would be using. But this is the only snapshot we got. So I probably, like I mentioned, they're only picking out a few um, browsers to actually try things out on the CSP. And at that moment, we were one of the browsers actually being able to capture the CSP policy. Uh, what I think is interesting, you see a lot of CNNs, you see a lot of other domains that they're actually relying on to deliver their website. They're using the wildcards because, of course, in the CDNs, you actually have a lot of uh, sub-resources, sub-domains actually delivering it. What's interesting for me is, um, of course, you have the three directives, but here you see the Chrome extension. And why is this interesting? Because at the moment that we were trying out to see if they were supporting CSP, they had some issues with the Skype extension in the browser, which was actually violating the content security policy. And in order to get rid of that, in order not to annoy the users, they actually mentioned explicitly the Chrome extension is allowed as well. Um, by now, Chrome is actually moved forward and even every uh, Chrome extension now needs to be CSP compliant, having their own CSP policy. So this is history, but it shows that it's actually a very iterative way. And it could be if you're actually deploying it yourself that you might notice some strange things popping up 
in the monitoring logs that you did not expect because certain browsers, certain local deployments might differ from the deployment you have in, in mind. And so that in itself might already be a very exciting directory just to see how differently all websites being rendered by my different users. Small intermezzo, um, I think already mentioned by, by uh, Philip yesterday, if you're looking at the websites, a lot of JavaScript is being used. Um, even the visual things like advertisement and social media integration, because most websites have a lot of other things running underneath as well. Um, we have actually <laughs> thousands and thousands of JavaScript libraries that we're including. You saw the graph in the, the session of, of Philip yesterday for people that did not attend. It actually means almost 90% of the, the websites are actually deploying at least one remote provider to deliver scripts into their application. Two out of three or even trusting five different script providers to push certain content as part of the execution environment. And remember from the first slide, this is all running in the same security context. And we have some malicious websites probably that have up to 300 different script providers being included. So imagine that you only need one to, of them to be malicious to take over your website. This is a website I would never trust any credential, any uh, sensitive part to. And even just opening the website might be already enough to trigger a few uh, drive-by downloads and other things in your application. What I wanted to add to that slide is, um, if you're looking to the top 10, this is the top 10 of scripts that were mostly included in the applications. The only interesting thing I want to mention here is five out of them are actually from Google. And if you count up uh, the different parts, I think you can easily say 80 to 85% of the website are actually owned by Google. So it means if Google is just being attacked or becomes malicious or is pushed by some government, they can actually take down like 80, 85% of the websites worldwide or they can actually see the client site or take over the client site. And this is something to think about. And we, what we notice is that a lot of websites are really f big keen on having analytics. And I, I really understand because this is the way you actually can monitor and monetize the way your website is being used. But it also means that you're giving away a lot of data about your users, but in critical situations, also the control over your website to external vendors. So CSP on the deployment. So this is a little bit old already, so I hope it's, it's improved since then but we can easily say the deployment is very low. So 0.3%. I hope with the, the relaxations, uh, with the nonsense, that more websites get on board. But I think, still think for legacy applications, it not, it's not an easy technology to apply. For newly developed applications, it might be an inroad to say we want to actually secure our architecture from the beginning. But if you're uh, depending on third-party libraries, if you're running on uh, or depending on legacy uh, developments in, from the past, it's not so easy to deploy CSP. And this is a caveat I need to tell you. This is something important you need to know. But still, with then, for instance, with the mixed code monitoring, you can still do some interesting things with CSP already being deployed in a majority of the browsers. And I think I saw in the notes uh, last week that about one billion of uh, browsers already are supporting CSP right now. Okay, quick recap. Um, we saw HTTP only flag to protect your session cookies from being read from JavaScript. So this is not protecting against cross-site scripting. It's a small subset reading the cookie. We could configure the CSS protection header, but it's already on by default. More important, this is really the, the new kit in town, CSP. This is something you should be uh, used to, that you know what's capable. But of course, you have to assess yourself whether it's something that you can use in the next project in your organization, yes or no. So before I continue with framing, is there anything you want to discuss, ask on CSP, on uh, cross-site scripting, on any of the previous topics? Yes? Is all of the services responses need to include the editors or only the first one? No, all. So because you can actually tune it per application. So this could also already also be one of the more interesting things in, in the next version of CSP that they could say, well, we cover it for a whole domain. But I think if you really want to fine tune which resources are included, it's kind of hard to do it on a, on a, on a full website basis. But of course, it doesn't limit you if you say, well, I know it for my whole application, to write one filter that actually says, this is my CSP policy. So I also don't expect every developer to write a specific policy per page. So we did some experiments in a research project where we're actually saying, well, including third party content, including resources, is all something that you need to ask to the framework in order to include a resource, depending on the language you're using. At that moment, your framework could be the responsible for actually 
writing up the security policies as well. So I think there's some niche there where you can actually have some framework support to create or to actually at least deduce the security policies. But at this stage, I think still there's a lot to be done to, to mature that, that area. Other questions? Is there already framework support to generate So that, I think that was a little bit in, in line with Dieter asks. I know that certain tools are already popping up. Some research papers are mentioning that. In, in, in my view, they're not mature enough yet. But of course, it also really depends on how, what, what is your setup. Because there is not a single setup on, this, on, the, on the server side. You might start with uh, Google Web Toolkit. You have Java. You might have .NET. It really depends on your situation, what is applicable or not. And I, I, what I, one of the things that I are really um, not keen of, the, the team that was working on CSP, you don't want an external crawler actually saying, this is your CSP policy. Because actually, this is um, the same as saying, well, I want to protect your website. And based on some good and malicious traffic, I will say what is the, the policy you need to enforce. So it's very hard. You really need to do bottom up from the application, say, this is really the, the things I need. If you try to observe it, what is the policy for you? Well, what you observe might already be injected by cross-site scripting attack. So, and that's something that I really are warning you from. Don't try to do it with the crawler because you might miss the things out that you, you, you typically don't want to miss out. Good. So I still have five minutes left. I will only pitch what I had in the third part of the session uh, because we had a lot of interaction and a lot of questions. What I wanted to sell here is actually there are two attacks um, that are having some impact on the way uh, applications are running click jacking, and also the way you actually can protect cross-site scripting, but in the domain itself. With click jacking, what is happening there is that actually an attacker might actually try to have invisible frames on top of what you actually are viewing on the website. And for instance, if a, a, an attacker has a website to play a game, but is actually putting an visual frame in front of it, an iframe embedded in the application, with, for instance, to log into Twitter or to anything else that might be having an impact, um, the moment you're trying to click on play with your uh, mouse pointer, you might actually click on the frame in front of it that is invisible for you, and you might actually trigger an authorization request. You might do a transaction or so on. And this is called click jacking. Because you actually are trying to, to make sure that the click of the user is not directed to your own application, but something you want to have under control. And um, the way you actually want to protect against this is actually making sure that some of your critical websites are not included. So a banking website or any website you want to log in, you don't want to be included in any, any other website. There's no reason for your e-commerce shop to log in that someone else is including you as an iframe. And a lot of pages that are critical should not be able to include in any other domain than your own domain. Or might not even be included at all in an iframe. So if you're looking to state of practice, a lot of people are trying to write their own code to make sure that they are not loaded in top of an other frame. So for instance, if you say I'm not the mainframe in, in the application, if I'm an iframe embedded in another page, I will try to, to rewrite the URL to make sure that I'm the one being loaded and so on. Well, I have to warn you, most of those ways to rewrite or actually protect your application can be easily defeated. So some technology exists to say, well, JavaScript can not run on an iframe. Then your iframe might do very interesting things to protect it in JavaScript, but will not be loaded. So be careful if you try to do it yourself. And actually, my advice would be, don't do it yourself, because there's actually good technology popping up to protect you against that. In the past, the X-Frame option, option, or XFO, was actually one of the issues where you could say, if I'm actually giving you a response of my page, I can actually say if it is allowed to be embedded in another page or not. So if you have, your web, uh, if you have a portal or you have your login page of your e-commerce site, if someone is actually requesting that from the browser, your security policy could say, well, this says, I'm only allowed to be framed in the origin of the domain itself. So other, other domains, if an attacker wants to, wants to include your page in an iframe, the browser will disallow it just because of the security policy you're mentioning in your page. And you have three ways. You could say deny. You could say only in the same origin. Or you could allow it from a certain origin. Because you might have interactions with people that you trust that are allowed to include it in your frames. A little bit more. Adoption rate around 8%. What's interesting to say, well, a lot of the technologies that have been proposed in the last two or three years are now getting introduced into CSP. So that's why I'm saying CSP is really the new cut in town, because people are actually pushing existing other technologies as part of CSP. And now we have in CSP 
the directive frame ancestors, and this actually says you're all allowed to have those and those domains actually including my page. So a common advice that people working on this technology have is that you, instead of actually having a long list of all the partners allowed to actually include your domains, you might want to actually limit it. And you could limit it by actually saying, well, you have a common advice to tell it per partner. So you have a different page per partner. And in that partner page, in the directive, you could easily say only that partner is allowed. So you don't have to give away all the partners that are allowed to include your page. So this is interesting. A lot of the technology that we saw before on actually trying different subdomains, trying to actually use the same origin policy are also interesting to protect your website. One of the things that we see, if you say, well, for instance, we are actually putting some technology in an iframe to make sure it's actually uh, not in the same security context of our own application. One of the exceptions is, what if it's running in the same origin? Because then it's very easy to come from one iframe and contact the other iframe and do the nasty stuff. So this is also something that HTML5 was becoming aware of. And I will only mention it quickly. Uh, I don't have the time to go in detail. What is being done there is actually with a sandbox attribute, you could actually limit what an iframe can do. So you could even say, well, you, you're still all running in the same origin. You have bank.com, and you want to include an iframe from bank.com. But you could uh, limit what that iframe in bank.com could actually do. And by default, the sandbox will give you this behavior, plugins are disabled, scripts cannot execute, it runs in a unique origin, so it doesn't have access to any of the topics of your own origin. But you can relax, or you can actually pick the things, the behavior you want in your sandbox. And this is done by the directive you give as part of the sandbox. So if you don't give any options, you just say sandbox, all of them will be enabled by default. But you could say, I'm allowed to, to run scripts in that sandbox. And this is actually a very nice environment. Even if your page is running on the same origin, you can instruct the browser, treat it as if it was fetched from a different uh, origin, run it in a separate origin, a unique origin for the lifespan of the browser. And in that sense, you're interacting with a page that doesn't have the full rights on your own application. And if you have untrusted com uh, content on your application, this might be one way to isolate it from the core of your application, even whilst being served all over the same HTTPS connection, served all in the same origin. Again, sandboxes have, are not so popular, but are actually being picked up by CSP. And CSP now also has the attribute sandbox. And you can also configure it with the options that are very similar to what sandbox had with the iframe. So again, you had technology in HTML5 for sandbox. Now it's getting picked up in the content security policy. And in that sense, if you say, for instance, I don't have an application that is already viable of blocking scripts because they have inline scripts and so on, you could still say, I do make some relaxations, but I'm using the CSP technology already to make sure that I can sandbox something or that I can, for instance, uh, limit how I get framed in other applications. And with that, I'm sorry for the rush during part three, but I just want to give you a flavor of what are the other technologies actually at the end of the, the presentation. I don't think it makes much sense to ex uh, show you the example and run over time, but if you want to actually um, see um, the example, I can do it during the break. It's an example of how you can actually combine technologies such as the sandbox and CSP to set up a security architecture. I would like to conclude the talk. And in the talk, I would actually say we showed a few features. And I think the main message of the, the, the talk today is not how you have to configure the features. I think what's important to know is a lot of technology and security side are now becoming more and more present in the client side. Browsers are really catching up on security there. And they are aware, as an, an application owner, you want to be able to control some of them. So you can configure security policies. Some of them also allow you to monitor the security enforcement and actually report back to the server. And I think this is a very interesting uh, new uh, paradigm that is coming up in the last three to four years in web security. Um, I don't think it's any replacement for the other causes on secret coding that we have this week. So I still think you have to, to protect against cross-site scripting in your application itself. I think you have to make sure that there is no mixed content. But I think those features might give you additional insights on what is happening on the server, on the client side for your server. And in addition, there might be an extra layer of defense because you might have a very good library to actually do output uh, rewriting. But there might be some failure. And then CSP can kick in to be the next layer of defense. 
but don't only rely on the features I, I told you today. I think they're really an extra layer of defense in your application. And uh, I think there are many, many more things to come. And I think CSP, within two years, will have many more features. And I think they will actually observe most of the security features in the browser within a very short period of time. I promised you I would show you the website. This is the website I was talking about, caniuse.com. And for each of the techniques you have, it will actually show what browsers are supported. And even the ones that are not fully supporting it, they will show you what uh, features are supported in that particular browser. And I think this is also something useful if you want to adapt or adopt one of those technologies. With this uh, website, you can at least see what is the adoption rate for my customers. And with that, I think I will stop. There are a lot of references here in yellow, but at least they're clickable on the website. But then you can actually read more if you want to know more. If you need more information, you can also contact me during the breaks or after what's via an email. I had a lot of questions. I think we are going over time. So I would say let's take all the, the next questions offline during the break. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.